evening. Welcome to the webinar, Clear and Present Danger, Climate Change Hazards in the Himalayas, which is part of the Biodiversity Conversations webinar series. These webinars are part of our efforts to discuss issues and ideas related to various programs of the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing. This webinar is co-organized by the Biodiversity Collaborative, the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, and the National Biodiversity Authority. My name is Jagdish Krishnaswamy, Senior Fellow at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, Bengaluru, and I'll be moderate, co-moderating today's session along with Dr. Roxy Matthew Call of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. So before I uh, discuss the topic for today's discussion, I just want to quickly share uh, a summary of the National Biodiversity Mission. So I will be sharing a slide. So the National Biodiversity Mission, um, its main objective is actually to raise the profile of biodiversity in the whole uh, development and economic development and planning uh, and governance uh, throughout the country at all levels of governance. And it's uh, got various dimensions and components to it, all of which try to connect various aspects of biodiversity in all its dimensions to human well-being. So we have a biodiversity and ecosystem services component. We have a biodiversity climate change and disaster mitigation component. We have a biodiversity in agriculture, biodiversity and health, biodiversity and bioeconomy, biodiversity capacity building and outreach. And all of these are synergistically um, summarized uh, through various other initiatives like Nisar Bharat, which is the national initiative of sustained assessment of resource governance. Uh, which includes exploration, dis discovery, and genetic characterization of India's biodiversity, the national framework for EPBRs, uh, and cataloging and mapping life of India. So the overall uh, goal of this mission is to ensure that, that the role of biodiversity in the larger uh, context of human well-being is well integrated into our development uh, planning uh, and our uh, future uh, pathways in terms of uh, economic planning and, and governance. So I'm going to now um, stop sharing the screen. So the topic for today's discussion is clear and present danger, climate change hazards in the Himalayas. As we know, there was a recent extreme event in the Uttarakhand Himalayas, which led to a lot of loss of life, infrastructure, and it caused a lot of devastation um, as well. So this has uh, brought our attention to the, uh, to the vulnerability of the Himalayas, both in terms of uh, its geology, uh, as well as uh, climate change uh, dimensions, and also the uh, potential uh, impact of these hazards, uh, which are emerging and are likely to intensify in the future, uh, in a biodiversity hotspot, as well as a hotspot for ecosystem services, especially water resources. Before I begin, I have a few announcements to make. Please open your chat box as details will be sent there. We have already received some questions by email and welcome additional questions during this webinar. Please use the question and answer facility to ask questions to the panelists. Questions that are not answered during the webinar due to a shortage of time will be answered via email. And you can also get in touch with us at contact at the rate biodiversitycollaborative.org. Questions can be asked even anonymously if that is your preference, but we encourage all of you to include your email ID while sending your questions to enable us to respond to you later in case your question hasn't been dealt with during the webinar. This webinar is also being streamed live on our Facebook page, Biodiversity Collaborative. A recording of this webinar will be uploaded soon on our YouTube channel, Biodiversity Collaborative. 
The channel also has recordings of our previous webinars, including the most recent one on avian influenza, which was held earlier this month. We gratefully acknowledge the support we have received from the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India for conducting these webinars. During this webinar, the chat facility will be disabled. Please do not use the raise your hand function. We request you to use only the Q&A function to send your questions. Issue for attending this webinar. So um, I'm now going to um, allow Dr. Rox Roxy Matthew Paul, and I'm going to briefly introduce uh, uh, Dr. Roxy. He is uh, one of India's leading uh, climate scientists, and he looks at uh, how ocean atmosphere phenomena have been uh, influencing global rainfall patterns, the monsoon especially, and the marine ecosystem. He's a co-chair of the Clever Indian Ocean Region Panel, and is lead author of the IPCC Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate, which is part of the AR6 cycle. So, um, so over to you, Roxy, for your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Jagdish, uh, for, for the introduction and uh, the detailed information on the national mission. So let's get into what uh, climate change hazards in the Himalayas mean to us and what climate change means to us. And this is a uh, very popular cartoon that I use very often to uh, you know, summarize what climate change is, the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. So the first panel shows uh, our situation on uh, many times when we ask what greenhouse gas effect is, still we have many questions. And the second panel shows what exactly greenhouse gas effect is, how it is uh, trapping, how greenhouse gases is trapping uh, cover, uh, the solar insulation and uh, melting the glaciers like over the Himalayas. And the third one shows how long lasting the impact is. Even our children, their grandchildren are going to have, have the impacts throughout, maybe thousands of years because carbon dioxide have a long lifetime. And the fourth panel is crucial, what we do about it, right? So I am Roxy Matikol. I work in the Climate Change Center at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology at Ministry of Earth Sciences. We are around 150 scientists working on uh, monsoon and climate change, all these aspects. So we recently came out with a climate change report for the Himalayas. Now, if you talk about the Himalayas, we can see that it's quite important for our survival. It's the driver of the strongest monsoon system on the globe. So all the agriculture, our daily livelihood depends on the monsoon systems, which in turn is driven by, at least partially by the Himalayas. It's a source of 10 major Asian river systems. It's also the largest reserve of ice outside the polar region. It's called the third pole to introduce the Himalayas to you. And more importantly for the National Monsoon Mission and today's talk, it's the biodiversity hotspot of which uh, Jagdish will talk more about that in, in his later slides. It also has diversity in culture, tradition, and languages. And now many of this is changing thanks to climate change. Now, if you look at the trend in temperature of over the Himalayas, you can see it's increasing. And this is a picture, the uh, yellow color shows the trend in temperature or the temperature anomalies over time from 1950 to 2017 over India and over Himalayas. You can see the temperature trend over the Himalayas is much larger, larger than rest of India, right? It means that it's a crucial hot spot. And even over the Himalayas, the trend in temperature is larger at higher altitudes. The change is much more. This is degrees Celsius per decade, it's around 0.5.6 over higher altitudes, whereas in lower altitudes, the trend per decade is much lower. And uh, if you look at uh, projections, so there is a, so in the in this figure, the first part shows the observed uh, observed uh, time series, and the rest is the projections. So there is an increase in rainfall, which is projected to increase. Meanwhile, there is a decrease in snow snow accumulation over the same region, which is projected to decrease further in the future. Now that will all affect not only the Himalayan region, but also downstream. 
we call it in IPCC and all, we call it combined events. So we see that the impact is not just left for the Himalayan region, but also downstream. For example, when we have a drought or monsoon deficit downstream, the water scarcity and the reduction of river flows due to glacier loss can also affect the entire Indian region. So that's in a nutshell on the, uh, on the climate change and the hazard impacts of over, over Himalayas. And for reference, we have a uh, new, very clean report on the assessment of climate change over the Indian region. It's the first report from India. It shows that the temperatures are projected to increase by 2.7 to 4.5 degrees Celsius by end of the century. And that might result in an increase in the intensity, frequency, and extent of extreme weather events over the Indian region. This is an open access report. Uh, it's uh, open for anyone uh, for, um, uh, for, uh, with free access. So I suggest, and it has a chapter on specifically on Himalayas. So that's it. Uh, uh, folks, uh, a very brief introduction on uh, the climate change over Himalayas and uh, over to Jagdish. So, Roxy, you'll have to uh, stop screen sharing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have to see where it is. Oh, man. I think you're Roxy, top, top, look at the top of your screen. Because my screen has, okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for that. Yeah. I just. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, Roxy gave an overview of the climate change um, aspects of, uh, of, of uh, what we're experiencing in the Himalayas. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what the ecosystem responses are based on, on, uh, on uh, uh, what the, what, how, based on the current evidence that we have. Trying to change the slide. Click inside the slide and then click next. Okay, so just to point out that the Himalayas have some of the highest rates of warming, and obviously this is going to have an impact on the vegetation phenology. So the rates of warming have been estimated at about 0 0.06 Celsius per year in mean annual temperature. And uh, some of the studies have suggested that the onset of the growing season has advanced by 4.7 days, but the end of the season hasn't shifted. So overall, uh, the, the entire growing period has increased by about 4.7 uh, days, which is quite significant for a, a pan-tropical mountain system. The other uh, evidence that we have from both remotely sensed studies as well as from ground studies is that 
in response to this uh, climate change and warming, we have both greening and browning observed in the Himalayas, depending on elevation, depending on the vegetation type. So there are some parts of the Himalayas, uh, especially at higher elevation, which may actually be showing signs of greening in response to various drivers. One is warming, of course. The other could be uh, CO2 fertilization effect and other types of uh, global change drivers as well. However, we also see significant areas with browning, especially in the low and middle elevations, uh, which is very pronounced actually in the Western Himalayas. And this has been attributed by various uh, folks to, um, to temperature induced moisture stress. So this greening and browning has been reported by a variety of studies, including some of my own work, as well as colleagues in many other institutions. Um, so this is something that we need to, um, to think about when looking at the response of vegetation. It's quite variable across the Himalayas, and there are some, ecos some vegetation types which are clearly under stress and others which seem to be responding in, in very different ways. Uh, the other aspect is that if you look at the relationship between, say, for example, the normalized difference vegetation index, which is a, a, which is a remotely sensed index of, of green biomass or photosynthetically acrylic biomass, it, uh, if you look at the uh, response to temperature, the slope of that NDVI temperature relationship, it plunged during the, um, during the 90s. So that was a very uh, pronounced uh, um, temperature-induced moisture stress. And in fact, uh, in 1999, there were ground studies on looking at leaf water potential in Kumao. Um, and 1999 is a very interesting year because, uh, because of uh, El Nino, and they were, it was a very hot summer. And the other thing that happened in that year is that there was in the post monsoon season, there was only about 26.5 millimeters of rainfall in the entire period from September, 1998 to May, 1999. And all of this was just received in three days in January and March. So basically we, we see this a uh, huge uh, stress on the, especially on the oak forests in the Himalayas as reported by several ground studies. and. The remotely sensed uh, evidence that we have also suggests that, uh, that, that there was a very major perturbation and shock to the broad-leaved uh, forests in the Western Himalayas uh, during this period and in many other parts of the Himalayas as well. So temperature-induced moisture stress is definitely something that is ha already happening. And the, and the post-monsoon uh, moisture available to the vegetation becomes a very critical factor, the winter rainfall as well as rainfall that falls in the summer. Uh, there's another study which has compared uh, Western Himalayas, Eastern Himalayas and other biomes in India. And we can see, for example, that winter precipitation emerges as a very important factor for the variability of vegetation response in the Western Himalayas. Um, um, so that is one, one, uh, one thing to note of that even if you have a very good monsoon in, during the Southwest monsoon, um, and if you don't get enough rains in the winter and post winter period, the vegetation is, undergoes a lot of stress. So that is something, this is work came, came out of uh, uh, Don uh, in IIT Mumbai. And our own work uh, based on looking at uh, remotely sent in, in, indices, when we look at the amplitude of the annual phenological cycle, the Himalayas, uh, even though they have one of the highest rates of warming in terms of the amplitude of temperature, uh, yet we see that the Himalayas don't have the highest rates in terms of the amplitude of NDVI. That means the, the growing season in the Himalayas uh, throughout the, you know, if you take the annual cycle, is still uh, somewhat resilient to the very high rates of warming that have been observed compared to other pantropical mountains, whether it's Andes or, or we take the um, uh, mountains in East Africa or Southeast Asia and, and so on. However, we don't know for how long this resilience is likely to last. And the other aspect that needs to be mentioned is that we have observed that there are certain vegetation types which seem to be uh, being converted to other types. So one phenomena that has been observed, especially in the Western Himalayas, is that pine has been um, replacing oak in many patches. Now, this is due to a variety of reasons, both effects of climate interacting with the local land use and land cover changes, um, and, and this is something that uh, is, is a so major source of concern because uh, broadleaf forests are very important in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services for local communities. 
And, and also uh, in terms of the water cycle and carbon cycle, the shifting of broadleaf forest to, to coniferous pine is likely to have a, a, a negative implications. And so these have been noted by folks working on um, biodiversity. For example, uh, when you have oak forests giving way to pine, there is a there is a decrease in the bird community in terms of the diversity. So especially the endemic forest birds are are uh, um, are likely to be responding negatively to this change. In terms of ecosystem services, also uh, other uh, um, other scientists have mentioned that this oak forest uh, pine oak forest dynamics is likely to impact a variety of ecosystem services. And also, in addition to all of this, the other change that's happening in many parts of the Himalayas is uh, invasive species coming in, which could be utilizing a, a climatic window opportunity or an opportunity provided by changes in land use and land cover. For example, Lantana has spread in many areas, which also again has implications for both biodiversity and ecosystem services. Two minutes, Jagdish. Yeah. Now to come back to some of the things that uh, that have been in, in our attention of late. One is that uh, Himalayas are extremely geologically unstable. They're one of the, they are the youngest mountains in the world. They're still rising. And, uh, uh, and so in, in terms of tectonic instability, as well as overall geologic uh, instability, they're very vulnerable. And when you have intense intensification of, for example, rainfall regimes, um, you also have a lot of landslides. And so landslides can be caused by, by rainfall and other, uh, other factors uh, interacting with the natural geological conditions, but also induced by, by uh, infrastructure development and roads and, and so on. Um, now, the landslides have a significant impact on vegetation as well as on the, on the rivers. As you can see here, this landslide uh, in, the, in the Western Himalayas has, uh, has consumed a large part of the forest here, which means that a loss of uh, carbon sequestration potential, biodiversity and ecosystem services. And all of that debris is also going to end up in our streams and rivers, which will also then impact the hydrology uh, downstream. So this is something that we have to think about the interaction of climate change and geology and how it's likely to be impacting uh, both biodiversity and ecosystem services and human well-being. Uh, so finally, we want to conclude by thinking about uh, the Himalayas as one of uh, the frontiers in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, um, of, for various, it's, a, it's a, called the third pole uh, for its water resources and its unique biodiversity and uh, the resilience of the Himalayas to climate change uh, is going to be um, a big determinant of overall welfare and well-being of uh, hundreds of millions of people in the country. So I'm going to end here and I'm going to pass on um, the session to Roxy. Thanks a lot, Jagdish, for a wonderful overview on uh, the environmental changes and uh, related changes in uh, uh, ecosystem species and biodiversity over the Himalayas. Now let us welcome the speakers on board. We have four speakers here for today's uh, discussion. Um, I will name um, all, all of them now. Dr. Aditi Mukherjee um, from the Water Management Institute in New Delhi. Hands up. Yeah. Dr. Agya Banerjee from uh, ISER Pune. Yeah. Dr. Pangaj Kumar from uh, ISER Bhopal is here and Ruji Badola from the Wildlife Institute of India in Dharadun. She's there. Yeah. So first, let me welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Aditi Mukherjee. She is the principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute in New Delhi. She leads the research group on climate change adaptation and resilience. And she has over 20 years working experience on policies and institutes of water resource management and she has a special focus on water energy food nexus. She has been a coordinating lead author of the chapter in the um, several chapters in the IPCC reports. And I have been fortunate to be a uh, co-author with, uh, along with her in some of the IPCC efforts. So welcome Aditi for a wonderful discussion on this topic. The floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Roxy, and thank you both for a very wonderful uh, presentation and for laying the uh, laying the ground. I am just trying to uh, get my clock on so that uh, I know I am on time. Give me a minute. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to very briefly talk about some of the work. Uh, this is some of the work that I did when before uh, International Water Management Institute, I used to work with the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, EC mode, which is an intergovernmental body um, with, uh, with headquarters in Nepal. And there um, uh, we did an assessment of the Hindu Kush Himalayan, uh, not only climate, but also changes in many other aspects. Ruchi was also part of that assessment. So I'm just going to present some of the larger level highlights from that assessment and actually they completely echo what Roxy, uh, Dr. Roxy has presented vis-a-vis -vis the Indian Himalayas. Uh, first of all, uh, I think with climate change, perhaps not in this audience, but in general lay audience, there is still the understanding that climate change will happen. I think the most important thing to recognize for all of us now is climate change is happening now. We are already 1, 1.1 degrees above the pre-industrial level. And these are the various RCPs uh, that are showing um, uh, the uh, basically how, how this is likely to progress into the future. But the important thing to know is that currently 20 to 40% of human population already are living in areas that has experienced warming of more than 1.5 degree. So it's not like something that will be happening in the future and we can all you know, slowly prepare. We are very much in the midst of it and the time for action is also now. Um, uh, then um, uh, the IPCC AR6 cycle has produced uh, many reports, actually six reports of which 1.5 degree report is, is uh, well, it's one of my favorite reports because it's also very, very action oriented. And uh, this report is clearly saying that uh, if you want to limit the warming to 1.5 degree, which by the way seems increasingly unlikely if you don't take action right now, uh, the CO2 emissions needs to fall by about 45%. We, net, we need to go net zero by 2050. And also that limiting 1.5 degree would require massive changes in various aspects. It would require deep emission cuts in all sectors, range of technologies, behavioral changes, uh, et cetera. Now coming to, uh, if, if that weren't bad enough, I think coming to the Himalayas, the entire Hindu Kush Himalayas, all the way from Afghanistan to Myanmar, actually, even if the world were able to keep the uh, collectively uh, uh, take action, you know, fulfill their Paris pledges and more, because Paris pledges also take us beyond 1.5 degree, but let's, let's assume that the latest uh, NDCs are much more ambitious and we are able to limit uh, warming to 1.5 degrees, it will still be too hot for the H cage because of amplified elevation uh, dependent warming that I think Roxy talked about a little while ago. So for example, um, 1.5 degree would mean 2.1 degree plus minus in the Himalayas and, uh, and then uh, um, under RCP5, it will be more like 2.5 degrees. So I, I won't belabor the point that the mountains are particularly vulnerable because of uh, temperature amplification in the mountains and these are also very very fragile environments not only from a physical perspective but there the fragility also leads to the social i mean many of these are ethnic minorities so there is also that kind of you know they are remote what professor ns jodha has very nicely coined the town mountain specificity so there are the specific things about mountains fragility remoteness that actually makes these mountains much more fragile and amplifies the physical uh, fragility and, and it through also social fragility. So in terms, I don't want to go too much into the glacial weight because I know Professor Orgo and others after me will be talking about that and I'm not even a specialist, I'm not even a glaciologist, but um, uh, uh, what our high map assessment, this HKH assessment is showing that even in a 1.5 degree world, we are, we are talking of losing up to 36% volume by 2100. I mean, that's one third of our glaciers. So we would be passing on a very different Himalayas than the one we inherited to our children. And I think that's a, the a reason of major concern. Now, if the work by IITM that uh, Roxy was showing that shows that the hour temperature rise expectation is even higher, two degrees would mean even 2.7 degrees for the Himalayas. And then we are talking of 50% loss of ice volume. 
so these are actually huge numbers with 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 manifold um, uh, implications implications uh, from a water storage but also there are various cultural implications is you are thinking of a change in the entire way of your lives for some of these mountain people uh, this is the same thing by the end of century at a 1.5 degree we are looking at loss of almost one third of the of the glacial mass loss this is something this is a slide that uh, uh, that's from easy mode and and this is uh, uh, i think the northern side of the mount everest if i'm not mistaken and this is taken in 1921 put your eyes at one place and if i just change the slide uh, this is what happens uh, in uh, 2009 so that's like uh, within 100 years you can uh, Uh, yeah less than 100 years you can actually see um, you know around 90 years the difference so basically the the glaciers um, the glacier in front has kind of uh, changed into a glacial lake and 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 uh, very these days we are hearing a lot around glacial lake outbursts floods so the the, the recent tragedy in uttarakhand was not a glof but the previous one was glof related so glofs will become more and more uh, common if these glaciers after melting they're leaving behind these lakes and when the moraine uh, uh, boundaries breach uh, we can expect more of those glof related um, disasters what do these changes mean for the region's water resources i think uh, i think the answer is a bit nuanced um, for one it has tremendous negative impact on communities who are dependent on glacier and snow uh, melt so this was village where some of my colleagues worked um, this is a entirely glacial fed irrigation village you can see how dry every everything is but uh, it kind of gets water channeled through the glaciers and once the glaciers melt or they melt earlier then entire livelihood of these remote communities gets affected uh, so so that's uh, that's kind of a very big impact overall the impacts are also likely to happen to the downstream but in different ways and in different basins for example in indus which is much more glacial dependent than ganges and brahmaputra uh, this melting of glaciers is going to uh, affect total runoff by the mid century but for uh, for ganga and brahmaputra because there's more dependence on precipitation is likely to be different and also uh, very importantly while may not be very direct climate change link as of yet but the mid hill region springs are drying and springs are the main source of water for all the everybody in the in the mid hills and they are also drying because of other infrastructure issues like um, building of roads and hydro power which con continuously cuts the recharge area from the discharge area um also there are uh, studies and indication that shows that the disaster risks are increasing as i mentioned floods droughts landslides glacial lake outburst floods they're increasing not only because of climate change but also because of um, uh, like the like the disaster the, the the social part of it is also because lot more people are living in those uh, you know flood prone areas in the in the flood plains and and things like that so so that's why you see also a larger amount of mortality that's happening uh, in that's in addition to the fact that the hazards themselves are kind of increasing uh and then some other studies these are all i mean the sources of most of the studies are here high map means the hindu kush himalayas then these are some of the studies again by uh, colleagues from from netherlands which is showing that flood magnitudes would increase and intensities of once in 50 year flood even will increase by uh, 40 to 110% in upstream and up to 150% in downstream area so there are livelihood implications there are disaster implications and of course there are biodiversity implications from the societal impacts and this is where i i do uh, uh, i am a social scientist this is where my research is uh, as i already said remote mountain communities are already adapting but um, you know one of the interesting conversations we had with these remote mountain communities is like what can we do now that the glaciers are melting and the saddest answer is they can do precious little because not that they did as leading to those glaciers melting right i mean the whole point about climate change is also it's a it's a it's a, it's a matter of uh, equity and justice because people who have the least to do with the climate change are are some of the worst um, impacted some of the things uh, that has been done are artificial glaciers and ice stupas in ladakh but also a lot of people have moved out of these traditional agriculture based livelihoods to other alternative livelihoods and that also means erosion of traditional livelihoods and culture 
A big issue in the Himalayas is also drying of springs. A lot of us uh, are uh, involved and, and communities are involved in reviving spring streams of hydrogeological uh, assessments and community-based approaches. Um, and then a, a, a big concern is outmigration from the hills and mountains. Not all of it, of course, is climate dependent, but, but uh, increasingly we would find a lot of impact of climate change on people's decision to move out of the mountains. That's kind of more or less all that I had to say. Thank you. And uh, over back to you, Roxy. Yeah. Thanks, Didi, for uh, uh, an overview on uh, how the ecosystem is changing, how the environmental conditions are changing over the Himalayas, the altitude, and also social conditions over there as well. Uh, now we move on to Dr. Agya Banerjee. Assistant Professor, Earth and Climate Sciences at ISER Pune. He is a glaciologist working mainly on problems related to Himalayan glaciers and their climate response. He is also interested in and working on understanding the climate sensitivity of glacier fed Himalayan rivers and that of the Himalayan landscape. The floor is yours, Argya. Uh, thank you, Roxy, for this nice introduction. I really thank uh, Jagdish, Roxy, Roxy, and Aditi for setting the stage. They really uh, explained very nicely the background setting of this of this whole discussion. And uh, I was slightly worried that uh, my talk would be covering only part of this whole story, which is what I work on. I'm a glaciologist, and I mainly look at climate response of Himalayan glaciers. But of course, glaciers are not isolated objects. They are really a big part of the whole uh, art system, uh, art system uh, that's uh, that's uh, we are, what we are looking at. And that that's that way. I've also looked at certain aspects of Himalayan rivers and landscapes, are how and how are they going to respond to climate sensitivity. So I'll mostly cover that part. But I'm again, I really thankful to the previous speakers. They have really set the stage for me. So then, let me start with uh, showing you. I'm sorry, I am unable to get rid of this uh, over here, but uh, are you able to see my screen? Uh, no, no. Do you see my presentation or? Yes. What is your presentation? You're fine. Okay, okay, then it's fine because I am seeing some window which is hovering over here. So this is what we are looking at when it, when it comes to the glaciers. So if you look at these circles, the colors are denoting the mass losses. And if you look at Himalaya, the signal is clear and loud that all over Himalaya, there is some variability, but overall glaciers are losing somewhat, uh, something like, you know, half a meter of ice thickness every year. And these glaciers are maybe 100 meter thick, 200 meter thick. So we, 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 we can, you can immediately see that, you know, it's a large number. And of course, as Aditi has pointed out that this is not new. If you look at the climate change signal from Himalaya, which you know one can look at the glaciers, how they have changed over the past let's say 150 years, you see there has been continuous warming, but there is clear signal that over the past couple of decades, the rates are going higher. And then if you, what is going to happen if you know the, um, because of this glacier loss? So if you think about it, there are two set of changes, which again has been already discussed by Aditi. Some of these changes are slow. They are happening over a larger scale, like the images we saw, saw where glaciers are shrinking all over. And they are going to immediately, because glaciers, meltwater, are a big component of the uh, uh, upper Himalayan catchments. They supply a lot of water to these rivers. So there we are going to see uh, seasonality of the runoff changing, which uh, has been pointed out. And then one more very important thing is now there will be stronger variability and there will be extremes because these glaciers, they are a big storage of ice. So the precipitation that's falling, that's fluctuating even between years, but that fluctuation is damp if glaciers are there because they store part of this water as solid ice and release it you know, over slowly over a longer time scale. Now, as glaciers deplete, then we are going to face a much stronger variability in the river runoff. And of course, these glaciers, as they're shrinking, they're contributing to the sea level rise. So these are all slow and large scale changes they are already hard to predict. As we have already seen some of the uh, uh, RCP scenarios, they are, uh, the changes that, uh, that we are predicting, there is a lot of uh, in uncertainty there, which I'll come to in the next slide. And, uh, and then, then there is another set of uh, events that are also becoming more and more uh, you know, frequent, are these uh, localized events like gloves, ice and rock avalanches and rockfalls, and they are 
even harder or maybe we can say impossible to predict you know event by event we can only think in terms of probabilities and calculate how the probabilities are changing because these are happening at very very small scale so when we are it's not that the processes that are change the earth system processes that are operating in this region are you know beyond understanding we understand them but the problem is the amount of computational power and the amount of data one needs to understand things happening at very local scale is impossible to uh, conceive that will ever happen so that's where the problem lies and of course we, i'm only talking about glaciers but there are related changes uh, in the realm of snow and permafrost which are also uh, showing up so that's where again but i will not cover them but they are somewhat related so this is a figure that ali has already shown so if what you are looking at here at de depending on what rcp scenarios we look at this rcp scenarios are the future our you know estimates for future pathways that we will take the climate uh, tra forcing trajectories and for a range of uh, scenarios the there is a range of global temperature change and that temperature change is amplified because of presence of presence of snow and ice in the himalaya and that results in a higher temperature change in the high himalayas where glaciers are as has been already been pointed out and that leads to mass loss and here you can see the uncertainty there is one uncertainty you know the numbers are varying between 10% to 80% and that's related to the uncertainty between these pathways but even when you consider the you know uh, set of pathways in any given rcp scenarios or even global temperature change let's say 1.5 degree which is the paris uh, accord but the, even there you see that the glacier change our predictions for future glacier change by 2100 glacier loss by 2001 and varies between 20 to 50 something like that so there is a huge uncertainty that we have to deal with even for things which we can predict the large scale changes so that's something to remember and then coming to the smaller scale more and more glacier is region in the himalaya starting to look like this so these are the lakes that are leading to this danger of collapse it's not not uh, so that you know whenever there is a lake there will be a collapse that's not the case but the more the lakes are the probability of having a clock increases and it has been uh, shown by remote sensing studies that globally there is a 50% increase in glacier lakes over last 30 years so you can imagine that you know the risk that uh, you know risk factor is already increasing but one thing about these lakes are at least you can see them okay so that's the good thing about them and maybe you can monitor them at least from space and see if they are growing or what are they doing or the new lakes are popping up and you can hopefully do something about them but uh, look at this you know the map over here you will you will see these are the lake locations the uh, solid blue dots and these are the actual recorded you know the documented glob events that has taken place and these circles over here those are the dams and the proposed dams so not only the as you know aditya has already pointed out not only that the risk factors are going high up our exposure to that risk because of the development trajectory that we have chosen is increasing so these are the factors that we need to really keep in mind and then of course you know all of us are now worried about uh, shock by this event that had happened on 7 february so here it was really uh, revealing to me personally to me because this was a small glacier over here now, now you cannot see it because the bedrock gave in and there was a huge landslide and this rock slide brought down this glacial ice and this glacier was about uh, less than half a square meter in size so typically don't even look at these glaciers because they're too small to study too difficult to access even in remote sensing they are too hard to map uh, so so and some uh, beasts like that you know which are we, we are not even considering they are leading to such complicated you know, such devastating uh, disasters so this is really an eye opener for us and here if you look at the chain of events if you know an amount of ice like over here it comes down it does not have enough energy to melt but if it come down come if it comes down with a huge amount of rock then it can get this fr frictional heat which will melt the ice and can start a uh, debris flow and moreover in the same region uh, so this is the location where this landslide had happened on tinala and this landslide came like this but few years back around 2016 another ice avalanche this, this that time there was no rock over there had happened and all that ice that had come down uh, to this region and stayed there for a few years so there is a huge amount of ice the ice and snow was that was uh, stored over here and because these valleys are so narrow it did not melt it was shaded and uh, you know uh, 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 so it did not have enough any melt energy to melt so all this water also contributed to the flash flood 
So you see, these are you know events which are uh, again. I mean, uh, all this uh, remote sensing data would have shown us these uh, events if we were tracking them. But this Himalaya is a, such a wide, you know, huge, huge region, and so many changes like this are events like this are happening locally that is very hard to track. And if you just uh, look at the number of so this is a map of this again same catchment this is the top of one dam which we are talking about. And if you look at the number of glaciers with similar morphological properties like the one that has you know, come down, you will see a huge number of them. So what do you do about these events where it's impossible to predict, except probably you know, in some uh, probabilistic way one can say, OK, this is a dam where there are likely to be this, you know, these events are like possible. Two so that's the, that's the, thank you. So that's the new challenge you know, that's facing us. So overall, to summarize, we are seeing that there is an increasing risk driven by climate change effects. And you have to keep in mind that that is over and above a background which is already large. As Jagdish has pointed out, Himalaya is tectonically active, so landslides and avalanches and flash floods, these kind of events keep on happening. But now their frequencies are going to increase. And there we have to live with the fact that some of these events can be predicted, but with a lot of significant, you know, a lot of uncertainties. And for a set of them, that even, even that is not there. Only we can talk about probabilities, and there will not be a specific lead that we get when you know there is a cyclone coming. So, and uh, on top of that, as we, as this being pointed out again and again, that we are increasing our exposure to this risk. So, what is the strategy now, and what should we do? Of course, you know, changing the way uh, development is taking place in the Himalaya. That's a uh, is a uh, big discussion needs to happen, and it's already happening uh, clearly. But that is a uh, bigger question, but even, I mean, something which is immediate and can be easily done is to minimize the damage of these events just by doing disaster management and keeping, I mean, the, the common sense standard practices that one should do, which, you, which was, you know, uh, glaringly absent in this particular event, like the people who died working in these tunnels in, tunnels in the dam, there was no early warning system. So these are the things that we need to worry about. With that, I will stop and thank you for this uh, you know, nice, uh, Thank you. Well, thanks, Argya, for a wonderful talk on the changes in glaciers over the Himalayas and uh, how, how it's all changing over there. 50% increase in the number and the area of lakes in the last 30 years, those are like big numbers. Yeah, well, uh, let's hear more from our other speakers. Uh, now I'm welcoming and introducing Dr. Pangaj Kumar. Uh, he is an assistant professor of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at ISER Bhopal. He's a meteorologist and leads a climate and glacier modeling lab, primarily involved in developing regional models, regional earth system models for South Asia, and for exploring its climate change focusing, particularly for uh, India. He is a recipient of the Ramanujan Fellowship in 2015. He was also nominated as the international expert on for PAC by the World Meteorological Organization. The floor is yours, Pankaj. Pankaj, unmute. You're muted, Pankaj. So, sir, thanks. Uh, so thanks, Roxy, and all the previous speakers as well for setting the stage very nicely. And uh, basically, uh, if you speak in the last, most of the things are already have been said. So that's what the point I just want to highlight one of the two things which has been said that it's a really very complex region, globally biodiversity host spot region, key indicator of climate change. And another point which we also should be focusing is that or taking into account is that it's a really very complex story and reaching to these areas is, is really not possible for uh, us to monitor all the glaciers and we very well know that there are thousands and thousands of glaciers residing there and how much we are monitoring hardly monitoring 10 15 20 at the higher side so to have those uh, system monitored in a broad scale we need a, another tool like models which we have already talked about ipcc models and all and i will be talking more on those lines a little bit uh, uh, in, 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 in my slides. So um, 
I'm Pankaj Kumar, and I really work at, as Roxy said, at the ICE at Bhopal, and largely working on development of climate models and all, looking into the glaciers. By teaching, or I'm a metrologist, not a glaciologist, but I do look the glaciers with the climate models. This is a very uh, general slide where I'm just talking, just showing which Arga has said, I'm just uh, uh, showing. Pankaj, you need to share, share your screen. Uh, I'm, I think I'm sharing my screen, not really. No. Uh, screen share. Okay. Yeah, it's come through now. Thank you. Yeah, so I was talking here. So, so this is, um, yeah, this is, this is the climate model, which uh, uh, we were talking about because Himalayas are really very complex region. And to uh, do the monitoring of all the glaciers is not possible. So the another option which we have are the climate models, which are really a complex systems. And to run the climate model at uh, very fine resolution is also a big challenge because global models, which we are we have seen all the results so far, are working at the scale of nearly 200 kilometers. And in Himalayas, within 500 meters, we have a change in the uh, orography of let's say. 50, 500 meters to a kilometer. So the, the, these kind of assessment from these models are really very challenging. I'm, I'm quickly jump to the my area just to show that how the life in climate models looks like, which we have we, results, which we are seeing. Like in a 300 degree model, the, the Himalayas are really very small, like 3000 to 4000 meters. So grid size are really very small or a 200 kilometer model or 550 kilometer or 25 kilometer models. Even though we say 25 kilometer as a high resolution model, but 25 kilometer itself is a very um, uh, small number for Himalayas. But at least in that number, we get the signatures of the regional orography and all those things. And uh, regional models are a tool where we look into a domain and then start doing all those things. Uh, one more statement before I go to the other things like all the CMAP models, like 3, 5, or recent IPCC report also. South Asia is very poorly represented. And in the regional model, they do improve the orographic induced precipitation, but they also have a limitation of overestimation over the mountainous area and, and over ocean more generally. So what are the options we have? So really what we can have a system where the response of glaciers uh, are interactively represented into the climate system. The problem is if the, we look into the problems, the interactive role of the glaciers in the climate system is missing. Direct and indirect feedback mechanism and poor representation, uh, representation in the today's climate. And if we talk about the solutions, more sophisticated approach is necessary as a, com uh, as a contribution as contribution of glacier met water is important for the downstream, very well said already. Interactive glacier scheme, which we uh, really are working on and then that can have a uh, coupled with a, with, with a model. Uh, another uh, limitations of the models which we have talked is that if let's say this is my uh, grid boxes of my model, uh, so the most of the IPCC models, even regional models, they have a static glacier mass. So if you have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, if you have um, uh, the, I'm just trying to get the pointer, sorry. So if you if your grid box this if this is your grid box and this is uh, this is your uh, glacier mask in year let's say 2000 the same uh, glacier mask will be in 2050 and the same will be in, in 2010 as well or let's to this 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 box so they are not changing with time in any uh, all the CMF five CMF six CMF three models the response is not taken into account so it's they are taken either glacier or non glaciated area. But and same in the RCMs as well. But what we know that the microclimate and the large scale climate as well, they have a very strong impact on the glacier. So we need a system where their response is recorded. So we do have a, a, a model where we have this coupling stuff and I'm just skipping this slide, uh, it's a bit technical. Uh, and I will show you the, the, some, some of the points which I just want to highlight. So this, this is the region which we are talking about. 
So a, a very well said by uh, Jagdish also that the Western Himalaya or the Western part is more dominated by the winter precipitation, largely controlled by the West, Western disturbances. And the central part uh, or the Eastern Himalaya that is largely controlled by the summer monsoon precipitation, that is the summer season, June, July, August, September. And this is mostly in the November to March, I would say. And this is the uh, cartoon which is showing, this picture is showing where our glaciers are sitting in the Himalayas. This is a, this is a glacier inventory. And this is showing pixels uh, at 25 by 25 kilometer grid box. And what we see that the, all the glaciers are sitting in the Western Himalayas or the Karakoram or the Western Himalayas. And we do have glaciers other areas also, but very small in size. Largely, the large ice mass exists in this part, uh, in, in this area, which is largely dominated by the uh, winter precipitation. Uh, so this is the slide which I was uh, try, which I was saying that the, or this is the point I was saying that this is CMF5 model, this is CMF6 model, this is, these are the ensemble, and there's a cortex exercise, which are also, this also are ensembles. But this ensemble is very small, three, four models. And this is a model which we are talking about uh, is, is, is um, with have, having a glacier system inside. So I'm just looking into the precipitation bias if I look into the, uh, into the simulations. So a significant uh, improvement in the precipitation bias in the, uh, these kind of modeling tools has been achieved. Uh, there are some noticeable differences are noticed here, but that differences are largely uh, and due to the very arid region, those areas where, where numbers are very small, let's say four, five point uh, five millimeter or so, the rainfall occurs. So small changes will make show you darker colors. But more or less, these these uh, system has a potential to to uh, capture these large scale signals or broadly the signals. And this is the mass balance which I um, have uh, we have calculated using this model. And if again, if you remember the Arga slide, he was showing you an increase in this area in the brown picture, or there's a, also there's a Karakoram anomaly. And this all has been very well recorded. And this the model has a potential to get such signals. And also it is showing the blue color some other places like in Sikkim also there is some reporting that so there's a, some slight surge or, or positive side. And obviously there are some places where we do have some challenges and not real answer. And overall, what we see that the mass balance in the Himalayas are decreasing. Another thing, another point, maybe I just want to bring into the picture, which uh, I have not seen much into the discussion, is that we, we do know that the Western disturbances play a very important role for that area, but we have not explored their, their role in modulating the mass balance and all those things. So we have uh, started working with a tracking algorithm, which uh, to draw the Western disturbances, to track the Western disturbances. And uh, we just looked into the quality of that, uh, that algorithm. There were 26 reported cyclones by WDs by Gimri et al. And with this track scheme, we were able to find that 22 in a, in a WDs and also taking into account that we have uh, these WDs are calculated over a defined region. So what we call it as a filtering box. So if I change the filtering box a little bit here and there, we can find all the 26 there. Two minutes, Pankaj. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. So um, another, the, this is the slide which I just want to uh, bring into the notice that we looked into this using this algorithm. We just looked into the how the response of WDs uh, are um, uh, are over Karakoram area, especially. I'm just I'm showing this Karakoram area, and we, if we look the uh, this the red dot is showing the period from 80 to 2000, and the yellow dots are showing to one, two not one to uh, two not 19. And this is nearly 19 years, and this is nearly 21 years. And when we see the tracks which are coming, which are originating, we looked uh, into these areas, these boxes. Sorry, in these boxes, uh, the WD is originating in this area. And what we found that nearly in the period one and period two, the number of tracks are really very common. Uh, uh, sorry, very same. The numbers are nearly 12 per year or so. So there's no change in the track density. But what we found that the number of WD is passing through the uh, passing through the uh, Karakoram area um, 
their intensity has increased and that in intensity has increased in the terms of i i would say that uh, i do remember it is in 10 percent uh, rise in the precipitation intensity so that's 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 a very good number so and also to uh, another thing which we notice is that 65 percent of the precipitation received in the karakora is based on the uh, on the on, on the wds i'm talking about the solid precipitation snow another important point which we notice is that 17 percent of the non wd snowfall in the winter we are talking about winter is 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 declining so non wd snowfall is significantly decre uh, decreasing and uh, WD related snowfall is 65%. That's a very significant number. And also the overall increase is, is 10%. So the uh, point which I want to highlight, or before I say that the last point is that we also notice that there is a shift in the formation of these WDs in, in, in recent decades towards the east by five degree, all those things. So we these things are still under those uh, under um, consideration. And uh, the another uh, last point I want to say that the um, if we look into the uh, larger this um, uh, w, uh, this mass balance of the tropic um, glaciers in 2000 post 2000s we do see still it is negative but there is a slightly positive trend but it's it has a positive trend I would, I forgot to put that picture. So we are just trying to see that how these WDs and all those things, does they have any control or the, how much they can control those kind of positive variability and all those things. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Pankaj. Uh, thanks for updating us on the uh, progress and status of modeling of uh, the, the changes over the, over the Himalayas. I might have some questions for you during the panel discussion on how we can you know, couple couple that to the local hydrology and impacts uh, uh, along that area. Now uh, <clears throat> we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Ruji Badola. Hi, Ruji. Hi. So she's a scientist and senior professor at uh, Wildlife Institute of India at Jaradun. She heads the Department of Eco Development Planning and uh, Participatory Management and conducts applied research on various aspects of wildlife management such as eco-development planning and human wildlife conflict mitigation. In fact, I saw, I saw that she had some, uh, she did a PhD on uh, elephant corridors connecting to the Corbett and all, and conflict and uh, so much of work she has done. She has also been coordinating on the Ganga Biodiversity Conservation Initiative under the Namami flagship program of the government of India. The floor is yours, uh, Ruchi. Thank you very much, Roxy. So uh, thank you, uh, all the previous speakers, and particularly Aditi, who set a beautiful stage for my uh, 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 topic. And uh, like Aditi, I was also a part of the HIMAP assessment. And I was the coordinating lead author for the chapter on biodiversity and ecosystem services, which was focusing a lot of, uh, on human well-being issues in the region. And one of the things that we were really trying to focus on was that the Himalayan ecosystem per se is an, a, you know, is a coupled system where the environmental sustainability, the social well-being, the economic viability is all closely linked and one has a bearing on the other. A change in one will have a bearing on the other. And um, as far as the livelihoods in the Himalayas are concerned, they are actually determined by the remoteness and low access to markets and basic facilities in the region. There is uh, a need for access to and a high dependence on natural resources. So uh, at times people do have access to good quality of natural resources, but the underlying thing is that there is a high dependence on these. There is a lot of vulnerability and multi-dimensional poverty in the region. And the basic characteristic of these lives, uh, livelihoods is that they are what we call as CDR, that is complex, diverse, and risk prone. And what I always feel is that it is their diversity actually, which makes them less risk prone. You know, the more diverse the livelihoods are, the less uh, risk prone they are. And uh, basically the household, uh, the subsistence sector could uh, be, uh, it is a subsistence livelihood comprising of crop farming, agri uh, animal husbandry, 
with some kind of uh, marketing which could be formal or informal the off farm uh, livelihoods could be you know dependent on totally outside uh, uh, resources or they could be in situ of course with support from community based institutions the development institutions and the public sector depending on how they are functioning and how they are coupling with the existing institutions in the region so basically when i was thinking about this i thought that i will talk about my work under the national mission for the himalayan ecosystem and this is particularly fascinating work because if we see this is the first mission which was exclusively set up for an ecosystem that is the himalayan mission recognizing the importance of this particular ecosystem for the human well being in the entire region so basically uh, we have uh, assessed the socio economic vulnerability uh, to the people in this region uh, to climate change and it, we realize that it is a function of communities characteristics as well as there the potential change in natural resources and ecosystems that could occur or that is predicted to occur uh, due to climate change and the exposure susceptibility and resilience are the three components uh, which would assess the vulnerability of mountain people as per the guidelines given by ipcc so our study was basically conducted in the three indian himalayan states of uttarakhand himachal pradesh and sikkim and it was the bhagirathi basin in uttarakhand the bias basin in himachal pradesh and the tista in uh, sikkim where the out of the total number of villages uh, by doing cluster analysis and random sampling we picked up a certain number of villages where we intensively sampled the households and collected a lot of information to assess their vulnerability and resilience to climate change impacts and uh, this case study that i'm just going to show you is from the bhagirathi basin in uh, uh, Ut uttarakhand uh, districts of tihri garhwal and uh, uttarkashi where we have uh, done a house to house study in uh, about 30 uh, villages highly dependent uh, on natural resources for their day to day living uh, people are uh, getting employment outside there are certain developments which have taken place in the region like the tihri dam and uh, now of course the massive uh, connectivity the road construction in the region which is taking place in the so we uh, realized that the village vulnerability score was a function of the village resilience score which was derived from the interplay of five livelihood assets that is the natural the human asset the uh, physical the financial and the social assets combined together and the same um, uh, then a vulnerability status of 30 villages was assessed and we found that the vulnerability status i mean the villages had become more vulnerable had moved to a higher vulnerability class after we deducted the risk score and the, then the future effect on agriculture was assessed and if the agriculture productivity of the villages declined which is which is the trend now we have taken the trend from 2001 onwards then the village vulnerability score further changed so out of the 30 villages 20 villages were actually going to shift from a lower vulnerability class to a higher vulnerability class in the current scenario of climate change as well as the development as well as the present development scenario and the future agricultural uh, changes which were going to take place again we found that the present uh, present climate shock was high in bhagirathi and tista basin as compared to the bias basin because the temperature and rainfall trends show ma massive changes in the villages surveyed between 2001 and 2018 in the bhagirathi and tista basin then again we uh, also found that the future climate shock is predicted to be higher in the bhagirathi basin followed by tista and bias as per the cm uh, cm uh, ip 5 uh, and 5 uh, data and again the future resilience is predicted to be low in tista and bhagirathi as compared to the bias basin due to less climate stress and higher resilience in the bias basin particularly because the agri the, the basic underlying factor was the access to natural resources and financial capital in the uh, uh, bias and tista basins which were and this was very low in the uh, bhagirathi basin in uttarakhand 
So the financial situation of the people and the access to natural resources was uh, very significant between the vulnerable and the resilient class. So to us, any kind of livelihood which which is going to be more adaptive, which is going to be resilient to climate shocks, has to strengthen the financial and the natural capital in these areas. Then we found that access to natural assets was less in the Tista Basin, very interestingly, because of the larger coverage of protected areas here. So people had lesser access, you know, because most of the forested areas were coming under the protected area network. There is less agriculture in this area. The, uh, uh, and in uh, uh, the resilient class, but in all the three basins, has significantly higher access to natural capital. But the plus point in the Tista Basin was that uh, there is a lot of development of ecotourism which is being promoted, as well as the organic output from this area is again gaining a lot of market. Then physical assets and access to government schemes was minimal in the Bhagirathi Basin. So we uh, recommended that the physical capital and the natural capital are the major capital assets that need to be taken care of. Physical assets and access to government schemes are minimal in the Bhagirathi Basin. Access to natural assets was least in the Tista Basin. Whereas in Bhagirathi and Tista Basin, the agricultural production is decreasing and interventions need to be taken. Although the organic uh, agriculture is being promoted, but in the short term, this is going to lead to a declining agriculture among the host of other reasons, which are leading to a declining in agriculture, uh, leading to a decline in agriculture output. And human capital was less developed in the Bias and Bhagirathi Basin as employment opportunities and other sources of income generation was very less in these areas. So uh, basically, we looked at the response. Again, this is uh, from ISI mode, that what are the top three responses to social and environmental changes in terms of livelihood? So we found that uh, you know, in uh, certain parts, uh, the environmental reactions could be changes in the types of livelihood which people are rearing, changes in the farming practices, or giving up planting of certain crops. Then uh, changing again uh, in Nepal, it was very similar. Again, uh, it was in the Eastern Brahmaputra region. It was again uh, shifting to more of off-farm off activities apart from the others. Then in oh, terms of- Two minutes, the social, Okay, I'm almost done. In terms of the socioeconomic response, it was getting uh, more and more into debt, depending more on loans, personal loans and uh, credit. And of course, uh, the worst was being affected was the quality of nutrition of the people in terms of uh, food and health were being compromised. So the high map vision in which we were working uh, actually looks at a future for the Himalayan region in which the region, region's people and societies are prosperous, healthy, peaceful, and poverty free, and food, and, uh, food energy, water, and environmentally secure and climate and disaster resistance. And this has to be achieved according to the high map vision by cooperation at all levels across the region for sustainable and mutual benefits, by recognizing and prioritizing the uniqueness of the HKH mountain people in all forums of decision-making and to action to keep the global levels of climate change to maximum 1.5 degree. But to this, I would add three more uh, as per my experiences. One is mountain specific education, which is being taken care of now that the EC mode has now established the Himalayan University uh, 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 Consortium, where all the educational institutions in the HKH region are coming together to devise mountain specific education for the region. Then mountain specific technology, another very, very important dimension where interventions are required. Here again, the Department of Science and Technology through its time learn program is providing intervention in this. And then I feel that when we are looking at mountains, uh, we need to look at the livelihoods, which are not relying on derivation of natural resources, but on conservation of natural resources. And that is why we need to focus on the payment of ecosystem services and create these mountain societies, which are not depending on the doles or grants from the downstream communities, but which are earning their livelihood as conservators of ecosystem services 
for a large uh, uh, you know a large uh, number of people uh, in the region so uh, these are my initial comments and then maybe if the questions probably get focused on uh, thank you all Thanks a lot, Ruchi, on uh, how the socio-economic conditions, social and economic conditions are affected over the Himalayan regions uh, uh, due to uh, changing scenario, cha uh, climate change, and multiple factors. And now it's uh, time for uh, panel discussion. So we had uh, a, a brief introduction from the moderators and uh, uh, detailed talks from Aditi, Ar Argya, Pankaj, and Ruchi on uh, different aspects from climate change to changing in glaciers to modeling it and how it's all impacting the livelihood uh, over there. And so uh, probably uh, I will uh, put a question. Uh, so we had uh, uh, some question and answers uh, uh, in the question and QA box and data from that, uh, there is a question by Steve Lockett. So I think, uh, it connects to what uh, Ruji generally talked about. Uh, so I will frame it this way. So there, uh, in IPCC and all, we, we have seen uh, people migrating, at, at least in some, some regions where the sea level rise is higher and all, and affected by floods, people are migrating to higher altitudes. Now, this will create a huge pressure on uh, uh, at higher altitudes uh, probably over down down the hills and all these areas so how do we uh, go about it and how how does it conflict with the local communities over there and probably the local biodiversity as well are there sustainable ways including the local community already uh, we have seen that uh, the real estate prices uh, in high altitude areas are going up so how do we manage all that uh, what is the point of discussion that you might have, Ruji? Yeah, thank you very much. A very interesting question, uh, Steve. First, I'll answer the specific question on Mahasir conservation, and then I'll move on to your comment. So I think there is a huge scope for working with the local communities on Mahasir conservation. As you are aware that in Uttarakhand particularly, uh, there has been a lot of focus on restocking of the Mahasir populations by releasing of seedlings uh, in the Tihiri Dam and in the downstream areas. And we can really see good population of the golden mahasir in these areas. And now the government of Uttarakhand has also permitted angling, uh, mahasir angling for, you know, game. So I think uh, the communities are really looking, I mean, they, they are just fishing, mostly for their bona fide requirements in the higher regions. There are very, very few areas where there is a huge market for these fishes. So these are very smaller markets, people uh, for uh, ma mainly fishing for their own consumption. But you know, there is a huge scope to engage these people into the biodiversity conservation, including that of Mahasir. And you know, I can just share our own experience across the river Ganga and in Uttarakhand, where we have created a trained and motivated cadre of local communities known as Ganga Praheris or Guardians of Rivers. So what it means is that we have focused on you know, building the human capital. We have trained them, we have made them aware, we have given them platforms, we are not paying them anything. It's totally a voluntary cadre, but we have increased their employability. So once they are trained, once they get a platform, and once they are connected to good institutions or organizations or community-based organizations, a, a, you know, a mountain person's uh, employability and exposure increases many fold. And it has a multiplier impact on the society. And even if we can show smaller examples of success where people are able to combine this kind of effort with livelihoods, you know, some kind of income generation, we have seen a lot of success. And there is a smaller model which is being tried right now near uh, uh, Dev Priyak. But I would not say that we have actually taken this ahead, but we have started working with the community there, particularly on Mahasir conservation. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Any other comments on that, Jagdish? Uh, or... Yeah, uh, so I'll just uh, try to also uh, club this uh, Steve's question with a question from Somadeep uh, uh, Panja uh, received earlier. And he was referring to fish uh, conservation in the Eastern Himalayas. And Steve's question was on, on um, you know, Masir 
as one India, as important fish species that is uh, that is being impacted by various uh, developments. So I just want to mention that it's there are a, a community based fish conservation zones which uh, where which uh, have been successful in the Mekong Basin. And now for the first time in Meghalaya and Manipur, there are experiments to have similar community based fish conservation zones over small stretches of streams and rivers, few kilometers at a time, where the community has uh, voluntarily um, changed the type of activities they do in the river. So for example, they have, uh, they're not going to fish in certain pools, they're not going to wash clothes in certain areas, they're going to uh, use the river bed and the river uh, in only in, in more uh, friend, environmentally friendly ways. So this is happening and this is a very welcome sign. And I think that for something like fish conservation, as Ruchi was also mentioning, unless we can mobilize local communities in a big way, uh, government schemes uh, and sanctuaries and and that type of model um, may not succeed. So we'll really have to mobilize a lot of people. In terms of other things that Steve mentioned, I think that we have not yet succeeded in having an effective uh, design of fish ladders in any of our uh, uh, dams and barrages. This is an area of research that we need to invest in because uh, our uh, Himalayan and tropical fish species are not able to adapt to the designs that we have implemented. We have only have a few fish ladders. Ones, for example, in the Paraka Barrage, we have we have NTPC built one, another one in 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 a the dam in Bhutan. Uh, both have uh, we need to learn from those uh, lessons from from that experience and really think about fish conservation uh, with the help of communities as well as uh, um, mitigation measures such as fish ladders and so on. Thanks. Add on to that, you know, it's initially we can mobilize the community. The ch challenge is to sustain their commitment to all these causes. And uh, we what we have experienced is that we have to every time move one step ahead. So we have, you know, suppose, for example, uh, these examples of communities coming together and protecting their stretches of rivers or their natural resource base that is just the first step and then we really need to move ahead and try to link them with the highest level of policy and what i can see and what i have experienced is that right now there is an environment the policy environment is there where the voice of the local communities can be heard so you know linking them providing them uh, these opportunities to voice their concerns not to us but to the highest levels, you know, which not only builds up their confidence, but the confidence of people around them on them. So, you know, it has to be something which is constantly ongoing. And the people who are collaborating with us or who are participating in such activities need to be demonstrated to be successful examples, you know. They don't need to be, uh, if, we, if we are not able to demonstrate that these people who were trying to do this conservation have succeeded, in all other ways, you know, become better at what they were doing uh, or have, uh, have a be better voice in the community or with the government, then again, it slides back. So it is Thanks. something which is connected. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question, not Ruchi. Arya, do you have something to pitch in? Otherwise, I, we have yeah, so I, for you. I was, just, I was just thinking, we are hearing these nice, you know, interesting stories about very innovative uh, ideas about sustainable development and environment friendly ways of, I mean, economic activities are being uh, talked about. It's very nice to hear all this. But then on the other side, I'm also reading in newspaper the number of dams that are being proposed, the roads that, that are being built. So there seems to be these two alternate threads which we are following. And so maybe uh, one of you, or uh, if we can, maybe you can discuss like which one is really going strong and which way we are really heading. Like how strong are these uh, counter currents of doing sustainable developments and things like that? What exactly is happening in? Can, can I answer uh, that, Roxy? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that if you talk to any person working on rivers or Himalayan ecosystems, um, the fact that uh, big dams, as well as uh, uh, infrastructure development, um, as well as other types of land use and change, uh, are are these are all non-climatic stresses. These are not only they are not because of climate change. 
um, but uh, whether uh, but they are all uh, impacts on the ecology of both rivers as well as the mountains. And clearly, they are uh, that is the elephant in the room. We really cannot uh, disregard the huge impact that the type of development that we are undertaking in the Himalayas, uh, what toll it might be taking. So that is uh, that is something that really needs to be addressed. At the same time, we uh, as uh, uh, Ruchi and others have pointed out, unless we can show uh, other uh, alternative ways of uh, employment generation, uh, of economics, uh, economies that, that are built around the ecosystem services or the, or the without impairing the local ecosystems, those models actually need to be uh, highlighted and um, upscaled uh, in a massive way. Uh, then I think that perhaps the uh, urge to to only pursue a certain type of development in form of uh, big dams and, and, and other types of infrastructure, um, maybe that uh, can be countered to some extent. But this is a very difficult uh, topic, actually. Yeah, Jagdish, I want to uh, uh, start some other discussion from that point that you said uh, about uh, having dams and all. So to Argya and Pankaj, uh, this is uh, based on the uh, backdrop of the recent Uttarakhand event, but not specifically to that. So uh, we saw that the geology and the climate change and also the local interventions in terms of dams and uh, uh, land development had, an, had a huge role in that event. And we are facing several events such that. So uh, based on science and research, are we able to extract the role of each uh, using using our observations, using our models. I mean, what is the status status on that? And how do we link that to forecast models? That's for Pankaj, because Pankaj showed uh, uh, the, how, how the climate is interacting in, in, in his model. And can we, can we connect that to local hydrology and uh, one uh, downstream on uh, future possible events? Argya. So, Roxy, this is a very important question. I kind of touched upon this, that there are certain things where we can predict, but there would be events like, you know, lands, earthquake, landslides, and uh, a glacier, uh, uh, lake outburst flood, where the, we can only talk about probabilities. I mean, it's, it's not going to change very much. But I think I slightly, you know, uh, I mean, take a different point of view here. I think in terms of action on the ground, what is needed right now, you know, to save, for example, this 150 people whose life uh, who, who we lost. So just, you know, common sense changes, like, you know, accepting this risk and working on it. We are, you know, not even there at that level, which is easy to do relatively. It doesn't take money. It just takes, you know, some uh, awareness or whatever. I, I think there uh, a big leap can happen. We can easily, you know, achieve uh, you know, some level of, uh, we can provide some safety net to people who are, you know, experiencing this danger. But and, and when it comes to this kind of, uh, you know, uh, science inputs that you are uh, kind of pointing at, yes, I think a lot can be done. And then people need to come, people need one, to come together. That I had one question, sorry for interrupting. One question that I had is, uh, recently when the Uttarakhand event happened, there was a lot of discussion and debate on whether it was a natural geological event or was it a climate change event or was it due to construction over that and i think we still don't have a clarity on uh, how it happened the role of each uh, each aspect to this this kind of event so i think we need much more clarity on that much more observations for that somebody talked about uh, uh, citizen network so i think i think we need uh, uh, local communities uh, for observations as well along with the med department and other geologists and all but probably we need we need a bigger plan for uh, on to, uh, to observe how it is observe and monitor how it is happening before going to modeling them and forecasting them uh, yeah, see, uh, absolutely that's true yeah thank you. inputs to tell Aditi, you are so, Yes, I might, might I just switch it on. So I think what Roxy is saying is all are very um, live questions and very burning questions as well. And uh, modeling of actually the, that's what I in my initial remarks said that it's very difficult to model all the glaciers. 
and if we go because modeling thousands and thousands of glaciers is not possible a, our individual groups can do and we know our glaciology community I, even i don't count myself as a glaciologist i'm basically climatologist so this is not possible one thing what we can do that we, if using the remote sensing which we have we can find out the vulnerable regions we can see we have a glob monitoring and all those things in that area and those channels, those basins, we can obviously can monitor and can do the modeling of all those things. And the breach point and all those things can be can be looked at in. And people are already doing all those things. I mean, maybe we need to uh, channelize this a little bit more. Regarding this event, it's very clear. And Himalayas are also, also very uh, geologically active. You know, every, every time there are a small trigger can happen. Anything if you have a piling of snow in the in the area and that can trigger anything so it's really very hard to predict such event unless you are really looking into some event uh, very um, like focus that you are monitoring something you've got to monitor those things um, otherwise a event which can trigger by small tremor and all it can be tremor natural tremor or because of some construction which is going on and that can happen. But the things which happened in the high mountains is very less that it was a like a like a like a human kind of impact was there in getting the uh, triggering of those avalanche or this uh, uh, Uttarakhand descent event. So I would say that uh, modeling obviously is possible, but possible at uh, at at very 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 small scale level. Not all the events because we have several globs which are right now active in the Himalayas. Yeah, thanks, Pankaj. Uh, Aditi, do you, do you have some, some inputs to Kishan? Um, so yes, I, I wanted to also respond to what Jagdish and also Ruchi was saying earlier. Um, uh, in the sense that can we can we showcase there are alternative models of development? I think that's a question that faces uh, uh, all of us the world over. Is there a way of using, um, you know, emitting less but still meeting the sustainable development goals? Coming to the Himalayas, a um, lot of the communities are doing a lot of monitoring. In the spring work where I work, Jagdish also works. I mean, there are these communities who are monitoring springs. He now mentioned communities who are monitoring uh, fisheries. Ruchi talked about communities who are monitoring rivers. But most of them are kind of doing it voluntarily. And uh, you know, our idea being, um, OK, th they are the ones who are benefiting, so they should just do it free of cost. But the point is that they also have their own livelihoods to take care of. What if these actually become like monitoring of springs is a service? I mean, that the panchayat, uh, you know, the local governments are benefiting. So what if these actually become proper livelihoods where there are these uh, trained uh, professionals from the village level who are doing these kind of monitoring and creating those databases. Can we look at it as actually legitimate ways of, you know, a livelihood uh, for, for, for natural, I mean, uh, for conserving natural resources? Can that become a source of livelihood? I think those are the kind of things we need to um, actually see and um, make sure that uh, these uh, and and that requires a mindset change i mean just just understanding the intrinsic value of human every human life and and especially uh, some of the most vulnerable people who are vulnerable because of no fault of theirs so so i think that's that's a mindset change that we need to bring about yeah thanks, thanks Adidhi. Jagdish, uh, yeah so, yeah i just want to uh, um, you know some of some of the questions which came to us uh, one was on research priorities, you know, if we had to each one pick one area that we would like to focus on, uh, what would that be? And uh, Aditi already answered that in the chat, uh, uh, in the answer, in, for example, springs, uh, you know, because a, lo a lot of communities in, in remote areas depend on springs for high quality water for both for domestic as well as irrigation. And so that's an emerging area of concern. So I would like each one, each of the rest of the panelists and I'll be uh, the last, just pick one thing that uh, even, even Roxy can also pick one topic that needs, uh, if you had to do answer that question or pursue that line of research, what would that one thing be? So um, starting with uh, Ruchi and then, and then Pankaj and then uh, Arga and then Roxy and then finally myself. And Aditi, you're welcome to add to what you already answered. 
yeah so jagdish from my uh, point of view i think it the payment of our ecosystem models for the himalayan region i think is something which is extremely important and needs to be focused on yeah i i i would say that yeah the, we should uh, put more emphasis on on developing more uh, sophisticated models which can be able to capture the response of uh, glacier climate interaction because ultimately we are uh, we are talking we are building all the policies for planning adaptation mitigation whatever uh, strategies we are doing we are doing based on the data which we are generating and if we are talking about the future the climate models are the only source of the information so we should have a better reliable tool to talk about our future that's my my first point and which i am also looking at it or working at it thank you sorry is it my turn now uh, yeah uh, so i will continue to study glaciers proxy hi yeah so there was this question on uh, climate science network uh, citizen science network and uh, i have seen live examples on how well it can help in collecting data over river basins and all because uh, med departments and all they cannot have several stations across river basins all over the country so uh, a collaboration between med departments and uh, citizen science networks like that can help in collecting data because uh, we lack a lot of uh, primary data over several regions thank you yeah i'll just uh, add my bit to it um, there are certain phenomena that are opening up opportunities um, and you know um, uh, ruchi would know much more about this but um, for example there there was a phenomena in west in uttarakhand himalayas where a lot of uh, agriculture became quite difficult in some of the areas and a lot of uh, ab abandoned uh, agricultural fields emerged and then now there is a discourse on on how to revive livelihoods and uh, what to do with those types of sites where people have and uh, not been able to pursue agriculture so what type of ecosystem restoration would sustain local livelihoods um and also safeguard the uh, uh, overall ecology because this is an opportunity um it cannot be business as usual going back to what it used to be and yet we need to think about creative ways of uh, of you know emerging um, uh, uh, land use that is much more compatible i mean in some sense Uh, as the uh, climate change impacts on the himalayas are uh, growing um, and uh, we really need to come up with uh, good adaptation models um, and this could include uh, taking advantage of certain opportunities that are coming our way you know there may be challenges but there could also be opportunities so i feel that for example that's an example from uttarakhand that that came to our mind is is uh, uh, how do you um, you know if not agriculture if if uh, combine what what else can they be that could that could uh, sustain both the ecosystem services as well as uh, the dignity and livelihoods of uh, local communities uh, so that's one response that came to my mind So Ravi, you'll have to tell us. Uh, is there? I think uh, you should just wrap up, and uh, uh, there's a last bit of announcements for you, Jagdish. Concluding announcements. Yes. So, um, so we thank all of you for attending this webinar. It's been really nice. Uh, uh, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined in and who have sent their questions in advance and also asked questions uh, during the uh, uh, during the webinar. Uh, all our wonderful panelists uh, who have added so many different types of uh, of insights into you know very different types of phenomena from water security to glaciers to to climate uh, science and climate models and ecosystem services and and livelihood and adaptation. Um, so that's uh, quite uh, enriching. Um, so. Um, so for any further information um, and sending us feedback please write uh, to us via email um, at contact at biodiversitycollaborative.org we request everyone to follow the biodiversity collaborative on facebook instagram twitter linkedin and youtube we once again acknowledge the support we have received from the office of the principal scientific advisor to the government of india for conducting this webinar series goodbye
जय हिंद थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीवन बाय बाय